Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to focus on today is the impact that accelerating information technology is going to have on the job market and the overall economy. And I'm focused especially on areas like artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, one of the things that really interests me is, is the idea of technological unemployment. In other words, the idea that uh, computers and machines are ultimately going to displace a great many people from the jobs that they're doing and create a lot of unemployment going forward. In fact, there was just a study put out by the University of Oxford, and researchers there looked in great detail at uh, occupations in the United States, and according to their analysis, very nearly half of the jobs that now exist in the U.S. could ultimately be automated or computerized over the next two decades. And, and clearly, that's a, a truly dramatic impact. I mean, you think about what it would mean for society and our economy if suddenly half of the jobs were to go away and all those people were to be unemployed. I mean, that's uh, an almost unthinkable uh, impact. And the conventional wisdom, of course, is that, you know, especially among economists, economists tend to believe that although jobs in one area may be destroyed, um, as the economy moves forward, uh, industries will be created and new employment sectors will be created, and so somewhere else in the economy there will eventually be a place for all these workers that, that have lost their jobs. Uh, I think that, that we are entering a new era and there are good reasons to be concerned that that's not going to be the case and that this time around we're not going to see those new opportunities being created. And, uh, I'll talk in more detail about why I think that's the case, but what I'd like to do is start out by focusing on some of the actual economic data. I want to show you some of the trends that are happening right now, and, and most of this data is collected from the United States, which is interesting because, as you may know, the U.S. at the raw is form of capitalism, so that all the things that you have here in Europe that are intended to sort of dampen down the extremes and, and generally uh, make things better for average people, we, we have a lot less of that in the United States. And, and one of the implications of that is that it may be easier to identify these trends, they may be more obvious, and they may stand out a bit more. Um, but in general, the things that I'm talking about um, are applicable across nearly all industrialized economies. So the, the first uh, graph I have for you here shows productivity versus the wages of what we might think of as average, ordinary people in the United States. And in, productivity is a measure of the amount of output per hour that people produce. And um, if you look at this graph, what you see in general is that the two lines move in, in almost perfect lockstep, um, starting just after World War II, right through 1973. So what's that, what that is saying is that technology is advancing and people are, are generally becoming more efficient at, at what they're doing because of the technology that's available to them. So, for example, a worker in a factory might have much better machines available and the worker is therefore able to, to produce more. And what this graph shows is that up until 1973, most of that increased value as technology progressed was captured by workers in the form of wages. And, and this era really shows the way capitalism is supposed to work. This, the, where you see the two lines moving together, that's really considered to be kind of the golden age of uh, the American economy. And, and what happened is that wages increased, productivity increased, and because workers were, were getting, you know, most, most of that value was going to workers in the form of higher wages, those workers in turn went out and spent that money that they had in their pockets. And that in turn helped drive the economy uh, forward even faster. So everything sort of worked perfectly the way it's supposed to work during that era. But in 1973, you see that the lines diverge quite dramatically, and uh, the gap just gets bigger and bigger over time. Productivity, or the efficiency of, of technology, uh, continued climbing upward, and uh, machines kept getting better and better. But at the same time, the wages for most average people uh, actually stagnated and went almost completely flat. And uh, for many people in the United States, especially those who have a little bit lower skill level, they're actually significantly worse off today in real terms after adjusting for inflation than they were in 1973. So what this is really showing is that the fruits of, of technological progress are essentially being captured almost entirely by business owners and by investors and by, by capitalists. And 
very little of that is really flowing to, to average people. This graph, uh, this graph shows essentially the same story, but from a somewhat different perspective. This shows the breakdown of uh, national income in terms of how it flows to labor versus capital. And by capital, I mean essentially the people that own and invest in businesses. Um, for a long time, it was thought that the, the fraction of national income going to labor was, was actually relatively constant. That was seen as almost uh, an economic law. And you can see in, from this graph that back in the 1950s and the 1960s, that's indeed the case. It, uh, it fluctuates sort of around 66%, but it doesn't really move dramatically in either direction. But then gradually, beginning in the 1970s, it started to decline. So the sort of workers are essentially getting less and less of, of total national income. And then you see around the year 2000 that it really goes into almost a free fall. So during that period, it's declined from about 66% all the way down to 58%. And uh, essentially, what's that saying? It, what, what that is saying is that the machines and technology and capital in general are becoming relatively more valuable and workers are becoming less valuable. And, and another thing to keep in mind about this chart is that there's a great deal of inequality, of course, within the labor fraction as well. I mean, this anyone that draws a salary or a wage, and that would include, for example, corporate CEOs who are making tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. It would include um, athletes and entertainers that, that, that are bringing in millions of dollars. All of those are in the labor portion of this. So if you were to somehow exclude those people and just uh, make a graph showing the fraction of income going to ordinary people in the economy, it would actually be a, a probably a much more dramatic this. This graph um, essentially shows the same thing across a variety of economies. So it's important to understand that this is something that we see all over the place. It's not just in the United States. Here you see Japan, uh, Germany, and China. And in fact, the decline in, in the fraction of national uh, income going to labor in China has been even more dramatic than, than in other countries. It's declined at about twice the rate as in the United States. So this is really a general phenomenon that we see everywhere in the world now. This graph here shows the labor force participation rate in the United States. And essentially what that means is the percentage of people between the ages of 18 and 65 who are either actively working or they're actually out there looking for a job if they don't have one now. Uh, and you can see that this climbed pretty steeply from around 1960 to uh, 2000, and that, that reflects the entry of women into the workforce. You have a lot more women who decided that they were going to work. But around 2000, it peaks, and then again, it goes into a fairly rapid decline. And personally, I think that what this is showing is that there are a significant number of people out there that simply find that they don't have any marketable skills anymore. They don't really have anything to offer in this new age economy. Um, and the reason, at least in part, is that machines and computers are increasingly substituting for people. Think in terms of um, a secretary who used to work in an office. Uh, you know, uh, those jobs have largely disappeared because of the advent of uh, computers. Now everyone has a computer and can do that work for themselves. So we see a lot of people that simply uh, can't, can't find a place in the economy. And remember, this is the United States where our social um, safety net is very poor compared to what you have here. So. You will hear conservatives in the U.S. argue that this is happening because the benefits that people who don't work are so attractive that, that they don't want to work, but it's very difficult to believe that if you really understand the level of welfare that uh, is available in the United States. So I think that there's a strong evidence here that, that um, essentially jobs are disappearing for a great many people. This graph shows the percentage of manufacturing employment in the United States as a percentage of all employment. Um, so basically it shows what, what percentage of the population is employed in factories. And you can see that back in the, uh, the early 1950s, it peaked at a, uh, just over a third, and that uh, you know now it's down to below 10%. But to me, the really remarkable thing about this line is that it's so very straight. You can see how consistent and straight it is. And that's important because if you ask people where are all the manufacturing jobs, what happened to all the, the people working in factories, uh, very often what they'll say is that, well, those jobs all went to China. And yet, if you, if you look at this graph, it really shows you that that's clearly not true. 
the decrease in manufacturing as a percentage of all employment is very, very consistent, very linear. Um, if you look, for example, after 2000, which is when China became important, uh, the line doesn't fluctuate at all. It just heads down straight in the same direction. In the decade before that, in the 1990s, uh, in the U.S., we had an important free trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. People were also very concerned that, that manufacturing jobs would leave. But again, you don't see the line diverging at all. It just heads straight down diagonally, very consistently. And what, what that shows us is that there's a very powerful and very consistent force that has been eliminating factory jobs. And that force is technology. It's, all, it's really all about the automation and the elimination of factory jobs because of improving technology. This uh, is, is kind of a cartoonish diagram that shows what our job market has now come to look like. And this is true not just in the United States, but across economies. Many economists have, have analyzed, for example, all the major economies in Europe, and they found this same general shape to what the, uh, the job market looks like. And what you see is that in the middle, there's, there's this kind of a skinny area that's effectively been hollowed out. And those jobs are what we would consider the good middle class jobs, the jobs that are really the backbone of, of the economy, or have been to this point. And, and essentially they are sort of middle skill jobs that require some training, but not an extreme amount. And they're the kind of jobs where you would typically come to work and do relatively routine things, um, and you would get paid a very decent middle class wage for that. These are, are the jobs that um, really created the middle class and, and, and turned um, the major industrialized economies into, into vibrant consumer economies. And what this diagram shows is that they've essentially been decimated. They're, they're simply getting fewer and fewer in number. Um, and this is largely because of, of automation and computerization. You can think in terms of uh, white collar clerical type work, like secretaries and, and clerks and people who work in offices. Those jobs have largely been computerized away or you can think in terms of factory jobs, where uh, people used to get good factory wages, but now those jobs have largely been automated. So what we're left with, as this diagram shows, is, is what's known as job market polarization. And we've essentially got two poles of this job market, and the lower one is, is by far larger, and that includes very low-skill, low-wage jobs, um, primarily in the service sector, and in the US and I think other advanced economies, those are largely in areas like fast food and working in retail. Um, they're jobs that offer very low wages. In the US, they're very often part-time, so that uh, people often have to work two or three of these jobs just to, to have a livable income. And very often the jobs come with almost nothing in the way of benefits. Um, up until just recently with the advent, of course, of uh, Obamacare, which is getting off to a bit of a rocky start, uh, a very large number of these workers in the United States had no access to health care at all. So um, they're really very, not very desirable jobs, and yet they are most of the jobs that are now, be now being created. If you look at um, any of the job, job market figures from during the recovery from the, the Great Recession, you, what you'll see is that the vast majority of, of jobs that are being created are really in this category. They're low wage, retail, fast food type. And then at the top, we have the other poll, which is higher wage, higher skilled jobs. And uh, these typically require, at a minimum, a college degree, and very often significantly more than that, perhaps a professional or a, um, a graduate degree. So they're jobs that are really not accessible to the majority of the population. And um, they do pay higher wages if you can get one. But if, for those people who, who really fail to land one of those jobs, it's now quite a long fall because there's nothing in the middle. And you know, in one of the low-wage service sector jobs. So this is, in essence, how things look now, but I think that it's also a very good illustration of the way things will look in the future, and I suspect that what's gonna happen is that this diagram is just gonna become more extreme. In other words, that hollowed out, missing middle is, is gonna get even larger as more and more jobs are automated, and we're gonna see at the top, among the higher skill jobs, we'll see um, technologies like specialized artificial intelligence and software automation and machine learning will begin to impact many of the higher wage jobs that are held by college graduates and people that do white collar jobs in offices. 
And at the low end, of course, it's going to be more story about uh, robotics and about uh, self-service technologies where consumers, for example, will be able to do a lot of the work that, that lower wage service sector workers are now doing. That consumers will be able to do that for themselves as technology gets better and better. So this diagram, I think, in the future, over the next couple of decades, is just going to get more and more extreme. So that then brings us to, to the real question, which is which jobs going forward are, are most likely to be automated? And it, it's kind of a deceptively obvious question. I mean, the, the obvious answer is that it will be the jobs that are routine and repetitive and predictable that are likely to be automated. We've seen that, obviously, already. But the thing to keep in mind is that the technological frontier is moving very, very rapidly. And what that means is that over time, a lot of jobs are going to get recategorized. They're going to move from jobs that we now see as being you know, fundamentally protected from automation because they involve uh, non-routine, more creative things. But eventually those, things, those jobs will get moved into the, into the routine category where they will be susceptible to technology. And just to illustrate that, we can look at two innovations that, that came out of IBM. In the late 1990s, IBM built a computer called uh, Deep Blue, and basically what it did is it took on the task of playing chess, and it was able to defeat uh, what was then the best chess player in the world. And that was a remarkable accomplishment for a computer, but at the same time, chess is a very um, well-defined game, and it has very well-defined rules. It lends itself to a mathematical approach. In general, chess is the kind of thing that you would expect computers to be good at, um, so it's really not particularly surprising that a computer was able to to win at chess. Um, but then just in the last couple of years, IBM introduced a new innovation called Watson, which you may have seen uh, was able to win on the American game show Jeopardy. And Jeopardy is a, a much more uh, open-ended challenge than chess. It's a completely different kind of thing. Uh, on the game show Jeopardy, you can have completely open-ended questions. Uh, in order to play the game, you have to have an understanding of language. You have to be able to deal, for instance, with um, things like puns and trick questions and so forth. So the fact that, that a computer was able to, to take that on is really quite remarkable. I mean, that's a much more impressive accomplishment than, uh, than playing chess. And that sort of illustrates the way things are moving. Um, where chess is, is something that we might have expected to happen, uh, you know, the Jeopardy challenge is really quite unexpected. It's an area where we wouldn't necessarily expect machines and computers to, to um, excel. And this is what we're going to see across, uh, across the job front, I think. We're going to see in the future technology take on jobs and tasks that really surprise us. And the important thing to, to keep in mind is that uh, very often people assume that the jobs most susceptible to being automated are really the low-skill jobs. So in other words, if you're doing a low-skill thing, you don't have any, any education, then it's very likely that at some point a technology or a robot is going to come along and, and, and uh, replace you in your job. But if you've gone to college and you have lots of education, you do something that's a bit higher level that includes more, more cognitive skill, then you'll have to worry so much about technology. And as this, this slide I'm going to show here is that um, they're really, you know, the story is more complicated than that. And, uh, as an example, consider these two jobs. Uh, a radiologist is a medical doctor that focuses on interpreting and reading medical images, like for instance, uh, x-rays and uh, CAT scans and things like that. And to become a radiologist requires a, a tremendous amount of training. In the United States, you need four years of college, and then you need another four years of medical school, and then beyond that, you would need, at a minimum, probably five years of on-the-job on the type training, training as a resident. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible amount of training to get to the point where you can successfully interpret these images. And yet at the same time, what we see is that, uh, you know, interpreting visual images is something that, that computers are getting really incredibly good at. We now have technology, for example, in airports that's able to perhaps identify terrorists by recognizing their faces uh, in airport su surveillance systems. You may, you may have heard that Facebook has got now built-in technology to identify faces and photographs, which has raised a lot of uh, privacy concerns. 
So computers, and, and you know, in terms of pattern recognition and analyzing a photo, is something that that uh, really computers are very, very good at. So I think that um, in terms of what a radiologist does, which is looking at an image that's very well defined in terms of its orientation and exactly what's there, and very often the the whole point of it is to look at that image and find something unusual, perhaps a tumor, tumor or cancer or something like that. I think it's very easy for me to imagine that uh, a lot of what radiologists do could be automated within perhaps five or ten years or, or even before that. It's, it's quite simple. But contrast that, for example, with the job of a housekeeper or a maid, um, a person that's just employed to basically clean a house. Uh, obviously, that doesn't require any formal training at all. And yet, from a technical standpoint, that job is, is really much more difficult to automate than the radiologist's job. Um, just to give you one example, think of a housekeeper entering a room and being tasked with, with essentially cleaning up the clutter in that room. And that, that involves a tremendous visual recognition challenge. I mean, you have to go into the room and you might see there are thousands of different objects. You have to recognize what is what. Perhaps some of them should be thrown away. Some of them should be put back in the proper place. Perhaps they should be folded up or reconfigured or moved in some fashion. But that's an enormous challenge. Um, and, and building a, a robot that could enter a room and, and recognize all those objects and then do the, the proper thing with them is a tremendous challenge in both visual recognition and in dexterity. And that's something that probably is still quite quite some time in the future before we'll get to that. So um, obviously, the, even there, the frontier is moving, and there are specialized machines or robots that do some of the housekeeping tasks. You know, you can buy a robot to vacuum uh, carpets or to clean floors. But building a robot that can do everything that a housekeeper um, probably a much bigger technical challenge than building a machine that could automate what a radiologist is doing. So the, the, the real message that I want to, to put forward then is that if you really look at all the jobs across the economy and you think about the kind of jobs that most people are doing, I would argue that most of them on some level are really routine and predictable. And what I mean by that is not that people are coming in and doing rote, repetitive things where they're doing exactly the same thing over and over, but rather that their job or their task can be broken down into, into specific blocks of things that are predictable and that tend to get repeated over some time frame. So you might have some people doing similar things every day, other people doing similar things every month. But in general, what we all do in our jobs um, tend to get repeated on some level and you know, they tend to be things that are predictable based on what we've done in the past. And uh, throughout our economy, there's now an enormous amount of data being collected, especially by large organizations. You can imagine that um, in large companies especially, every transaction obviously is recorded, every interaction with customers, every customer support instance, every customer service call, all those things, um, together with the ultimate outcome, gets recorded somewhere. And uh, so there's an the enormous amount of all this data out there that is really um, sort of waiting for an algorithm someday to come through and sort of churn through it and look at all the relationships and, and kind of figure out what's going on. That's the essence of what machine learning is. Uh, machine learning involves having an algorithm looking at enormous amounts of data and finding correlations and essentially understanding, you know, if these things are happening, then this will also happen. And, and in the future, we're going to see that kind of technology be used to automate a great many jobs, and it will happen both at the top in terms of people that are doing more, more cognitive type jobs, you know, sitting in front of computers, and also at the, the lower skill jobs in terms of um, robots. So that's going to be the primary thing that, that drives, drives all of this going forward. So then the, the real question that all this leads to is then why is this time different? Because we know that obviously technology has been going on, has, has been progressing for a long time, right? at least going back to the Industrial Revolution. And the whole issue of technological unemployment or machines putting people out of work has been raised many times, uh, most famously about 200 years ago during the Luddite revolt in, in England. But even since then, it's been raised many times. And, uh, what we've seen is that while there has been uh, sort of temporary unemployment, we've seen certain instances of, of technology uh, pushing people out. Over the long run, the economy has always adapted. Um, we've never seen permanent long-term employment. People have 
have always found a new place as, as things have adjusted. Um, and of course, the most famous example of that is uh, probably the, the mechanization of agriculture. There used to be millions and millions of people working essentially in the fields, and then tractors came along and specialized agricultural equipment came along, and uh, you know, millions of those jobs were lost, but what happened is that those people moved to another area, and, there, and the area that they, they initially moved to was manufacturing. So people moved from agriculture to factories, and then of course automation took hold in the factories, and uh, those people then moved into the service sector. So we now find it in the United States and in the advanced countries in Europe that most people are now employed in the, in the uh, service sector. Um, so historically, this kind of happened on an industry by industry or sector by sector basis, and it happened on the on the basis of fairly specialized technology. In other words, you had specialized agricultural technology that displaced those workers. And then in factories, you had specialized automation technology that displaced those workers. And uh, then everyone moved to the service sector. Well, what we see right now is really quite different. Uh, information technology is a true general purpose technology. It's a little bit like electricity in the sense that it's everywhere. So it's now um, sort of invading every industry every employer, every part of the economy. There isn't any industry that's going to get a pass on information technology. It's going to sort of impact everywhere all at once, and it's going to make, uh, I think, the whole economy less than it may affect um, So the, the real question, or the real issue that, that is important now is not so much where you worked. Um, I think the, the idea of looking at particular industries and whether the jobs that are lost in one industry will be recovered when a new industry comes up in the future is, is really outdated. That's not the way things are going to work anymore. What's important now is the nature of the job. Are you doing something that is on some level fundamentally routine and predictable? And if the answer to that is yes, then ultimately there will probably be a technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or, or uh, robotics, that is going to threaten the job. Uh, the most protected jobs, the ones that are going to stick along for the longest, are going to be the ones that are genuinely non-routine essentially creative. If you've got a job where you get paid to think blue sky thoughts and do really creative things, then you may, you'll be okay for much longer than the person that's doing the more routine thing. But that's really a relatively small number of jobs. There's simply, throughout the whole economy, aren't that many people that are paid to sit and think. Most people are getting paid to do fairly routine things. So one of the, the assumptions that I think most economists make is that while we may see you know, jobs today uh, eliminated, um, the industries of the future will sort of pick up the slack. And we know that there will be, certainly, as we, as we have this ongoing process called creative disruption, even though older industries may disappear and employment sectors may disappear, there definitely will be new industries created in the future. Uh, we can already think of, of some of those. You know, probably nanotechnology will come to be a very important industry. Um, 3D printing is another one. These will certainly become more important in the future, but the question is, will there be jobs? And I think there are good reasons to be concerned that there really won't be many jobs in these new industries. They're not going to be labor intensive at all. And to illustrate that, let's look at two industries that we have now. Um, compare the automotive industry to, to the information technology industry. In 1979, General Motors, at its peak employment, had worldwide about, uh, about 840,000 workers. And it earned about $11 billion. That's in today's dollars, in other words, adjusted for inflation. But compared that to Google last year, Google had only 38,000 workers, which is less than 5% of the number that General Motors had. And yet it earned $14 billion in, in earnings, which is 20% more than General Motors earned back in, in uh, 1979. So you can see th the dramatic difference there. Google has become this tremendously powerful and influential company, and yet it employ, employs such a, a small number of people. And I think that there's really an abundance of evidence to suggest that the industries of the future, whatever they may be, are going to look a lot more like Google than, than like General Motors. They're all going to incorporate very, very powerful information technology right from the get-go, and they simply are not going to have a need to hire many people. Um, and at the same time, the more traditional industries, like the automotive industry, uh, the industries that are today still fairly labor intensive, and that would be areas like retail, uh, fast food, you know, general food preparation, hotels and accommodations, 
those industries are going to also be disrupted by information technology. And so they're also, over time, going to be um, transitioning to look more and more like Google. So the future is really a lot of industries that, that really look more like Google in terms of the number of people that, people that they hire. And that's sort of the, the basis of why I really think we're going to run into a technological unemployment problem going forward. So what, the way I like to think about this, obviously all this is, is being driven by an acceleration in information technology um, that goes back at least to, uh, until the, the years probably of World War II. And the most famous or well-known aspect of that acceleration is of course Moore's Law, which basically says that every two years, computers get twice as fast. And that's been going on for decades now. Um, but the way I like to, to think about this is in terms of a, a, a bank account. I like to think in terms of depositing a penny, a single penny, in a bank account back in the late 1940s, which was the time when the first real digital uh, computers appeared. If you deposited a, a penny then and you double it every two years, according to, uh, to Moore's Law, today you would have over $4 billion in your bank account. And obviously that began very gradually. It started out with one penny, and then it became two pennies, and then four, and then eight cents. So it happened very, very gradually. Initially there was very little progress, but it's the nature of that kind of acceleration or exponential progress that over the time it becomes much more dramatic. So today we're at $4 billion, and the point is that moving forward, we're going to leverage that enormous account balance. So you know, two years from now, instead of $4 billion, we're going to have almost $9 billion, and then Two years beyond that, we're going to have uh, you know, over 18 billion. So it's, it's an incredible amount of absolute progress that we see. And that progress is primarily being driven by the fact that that account balance is now so large. So it's, you know, that, that's the nature of an exponential trend is that once the account balance becomes large, that becomes the primary driver of, of, of progress. And so that's why things are going to move so rapidly. Things are going to move much more rapidly in the next 10 or 20 years than than what we expect because of this incredible and um, ever-increasing account balance. And so what uh, I think that really brings us to next is really kind of a moral question. And, and the point here is that we've had this enormous amount of progress, but it has been driven really by the accumulated um, efforts of, of generations of people. So. You know, you have countless of people over generations working on this issue, um, going back at least to, to World War II and, uh, and arguably even going back to the Renaissance. Um, you know, everything that every, everyone does, every innovation, essentially stands on the shoulders of those who have come before. Uh, so, for example, you, you can, if you go back to the beginnings of information technology, um, you can think in terms of Alan Turing and people like that, for instance, who made really the major, major contributions right in the beginning. And then obviously, uh, people like that did not become billionaires. And the reason was that their, their contributions were incredibly important, but they came right at the beginning of this process when our technological account balance was, was measured in pennies. Um, today, after lots of innovation, we've got a, an account balance me measured in billions, and that, you know, that's been an ongoing process that has involved lots and lots of people. It's, an also, it's also a process that uh, has been funded by taxpayers to a large extent. For example, in the United States, you look at uh, the agency DARPA, which is part of the Defense Department, was the agency that, that created the, um, the computer network that eventually became the, inter the internet. Um, DARPA also also financed uh, the research that went into Siri, which is the, the personal assistant that runs on iPhones. And um, over the decades, there was a tremendous amount of government support to research in universities, um, into the, uh, the basics of semiconductor research and so forth. So um, there, there was obviously a lot of, of taxpayer support for all of the technologies that have resulted in this, uh, this acceleration over decades. And clearly, if you, if you went back and you asked the, the middle class taxpayers who were back in the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, you know, if you asked them, why did you support this? Why did you, why did you support the government uh, doing all this research? They would have almost certainly said, 
We did it because we thought our lives would be better and, and the lives of our children and our grandchildren would be better. Um, they certainly didn't do it with the expectation that the, uh, the middle class was you know, essentially going to disappear. Um, and yet that's one of the implications that, that we're seeing here. Um, and so what, what it comes down to is that you know, we need to ask the question, who really owns or has a, has a claim on this enormous technological account balance that we now have? Um, because the way things work right now is that the innovators of today are able to, to sort of come on the scene and they do very important things. They, they come up with brilliant ideas and they create companies perhaps like Google, perhaps like Facebook, perhaps like uh, Amazon. They become enormously successful and they become, of course, tremendously wealthy. They become billionaires and they have enormous influence, and yet what they're doing is really, again, it's primarily leveraging that technological account balance. Um, their innovations are important, but fundamentally they're also kind of incremental. Um, and the fantastic success that a small number of people are realizing is largely, become, is largely because of that accumulated balance. And, and as I'm, I'm sort of suggesting here, one of the other implications of all this technology is that opportunities for average people, ordinary people in the economy, the kind of people that go to uh, work and you know work an average job, uh, opportunities are really kind of evaporating for those people, and their their likelihood of having um, a good future and a good livelihood is really kind of evaporating, and it's coming about because of this technological account balance that's being leveraged um, by relatively few people. So we really, I think, need to rethink who owns that collective innovation, the collective um, account balance or our accumulated uh, technological innovation over the, over the course of decades. And I think you can make a pretty good argument that society as a whole should have some, some ownership of that. And then this leads us to what is really, um, I think, the central economic issue that we're going to have to face, which is that uh, Eventually, we're going to run out of consumers. We're going to run out of people that have sufficient discretionary income to really go out and buy the things that are being produced and, and uh, drive the economy. And the reason, of course, is that the vast majority of people rely on a job for their, for their income. And, and without that job, they can't spend. Um, and it brings us to, to an important point that, that I often make, which is that machines and computers don't, don't consume in the economic sense. Um, you know, a robot, for example, at least in the factories, uh, does not go out and spend money to replace the worker and take the job away. But if you think in terms of an industrial robot used by an auto plant, for example, if the cars being produced at fact by that factory can't be sold because there are no consumers out there with money to buy the cars, then ultimately that factory will get shut down and, and the robot will be turned off. So. You know, robots can take work, but they can't, they can't drive consumption. And in our economic system, there are really only two entities that provide final or end demand that really drives the economy. One is individual people, and that's the vast majority of it, and the other is governments. Um, businesses, of course, also go and buy things, um, but that is not the end consumption that really drives the economy because those are inputs to the production process. When a, when a business purchases things, you know, products or services, it, it then uses those to produce something else, and if that thing in turn can't be sold, then the business will shut down, it won't be successful. So, if, you know, one business may sell to another business, and then that business in turn sells to a consumer, but at the end of the line, there has to be a, a regular person who buys things because they want things or they need it, whether, or either that or it's a government, but, uh, you know, businesses of, of themselves can't, can't um, keep this sustainable. So it is critically important that uh, we get uh, purchasing power into the hands of consumers because without that, we really don't have an economy. Uh, another question I'm often asked as a, as a result of this is, well, we may have lots of automation and we may have job losses and we may have very low wages because of technology, but still won't things be okay because everything is gonna be really cheap. You know, the, the computers and the robots and and everything, you will be able to make things really cheaply, so that even though your, your wage is low or you're only unemployed, you'll still be able to get things inexpensively. And that's true to some extent, but the thing to really keep in mind is that our prosperity in developed countries has really been an inflationary story. Um, think about what 
uh, cost to buy a cup of coffee today as opposed to, say, 50 years ago. And, and obviously, the cup of coffee today is obviously dramatically more expensive um, in nominal terms. Um, you know, we have all become more wealthy in relative terms because our real wages have increased. And that basically what it means is that our, our incomes or our wages have increased faster than prices of the things that we buy have increased. Um, but the people who kind of think that, that automation and low prices will solve the problem sort of flip that on its head and they say that, well, maybe it will be okay because wages may collapse or you may not have an income at all, but prices will fall even faster in the future because, because of all this automated production. Um, and the problem with that is that it's really a deflationary scenario. And um, you won't find many economists who would, who would advocate deflation or an ongoing fall in prices as a good uh, road to prosperity in the future. One of the biggest problems with deflation is that it makes your, your debts more and more burdensome. In other words, any, any money that you owe today is measured in nominal terms, so if then going forward, you don't see increases in your wages, um, it gets harder and harder to service that debt, and so the, the debt eventually becomes overwhelming. Um, deflation and falling prices is also bad because it, it doesn't offer uh, much incentive for innovation and investment in the future. So we really don't want to follow a deflationary path. We want to get back on that, what we've seen historically, which is where wages and income actually increase over time. Uh, this is a graph that, that is taken from my, my book, The Lights in the Tunnel, and what it is really intended to illustrate is the, the sort of path that the wage or the value of a worker is going to follow over time. And if you think of the graph beginning back, um, say, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, um, you can see that it begins to go up uh, quite rapidly, and, and essentially this is saying that workers are becoming more valuable, and the reason they're becoming more valuable is that the machines they use, the technology that they use in their jobs is getting better, and it's making them more valuable, more productive, able to create more. And so their wages are increasing sort of in line with that. And, and that upward trend is still what most people, and especially most economists, believe to be sort of the conventional wisdom that it will continue indefinitely. And what I'm trying to show here is that I don't think it's the case that it will continue indefinitely because ultimately you reach a point where the machines essentially get too good. They, they start to run themselves. And once that happens, then the value of the worker begins to sort of flatten out because the, the worker isn't really needed anymore, at least not so much. And it sort of flattens out and then it eventually goes in, even into decline. And if you could get to a point where uh, the machine is completely autonomous, then of course the, the worker has no value at all because there's no role for him. And so th that's what this is reflecting. And remember, this is a graph that's intended to show what's going on with the average worker. In other words, for on average all workers. And so as, the, as this develops and as it applies to more and more people in, in our economy, you know, our, our overall economy will also begin to look like this because as, as the earnings of people overall goes into stagnation and then decline, they don't have any purchasing power to go out and continue driving the economy. So this is sort of a, a scenario showing that, that we may have very limited growth as a result of advancing technology. So the question then becomes what can we do about all this? What, what kind of solutions might we propose? And uh, one of the things that I focused on here, obviously, is that higher skilled jobs are also very susceptible to automation. In fact, if you're working in front of a computer just doing cognitive-type things, uh, in some ways your, your job may actually be easier to automate because it requires really only software, it doesn't require expensive robots and things. So what that says is that the very conventional solution that we're always offered, which is that give people more training, give them more education, so that they can do a higher level job, that, that simply may not work because those jobs are also going to be uh, quite likely to be automated. So I think we need to do something different. And um, what I have proposed is that eventually we're going to have to move toward a guaranteed income model where everyone is, a, is, is guaranteed at least some livable income in, in our society and in our economy. And you may have heard, for example, that uh, that came up recently in Switzerland where they're actually talking about that. Uh, Although in most other countries, and certainly in the U.S., it's, it's fairly unthinkable. Um, but I, I do think that ultimately that's the direction that we probably will have to go if we want capitalism to continue to be functional, in the sense that if we want people to continue to have the incomes that they need in order to go out and 
and buy things and keep the economy going. But the other thing that I have also advocated is that rather than simply giving everyone a guaranteed income, we ought to build some basic incentives into that. Because if you look at real jobs today and, and the kind of jobs that people do, there are important incentives built into that that really um, are important. And uh, most notable is the incentive to go and get, get educated. Uh, a lot of people today pursue education because they believe that will lead to a better job. If in the future that's going to become perhaps less true because there are simply less jobs out there, I think that uh, it makes a lot of sense to build that incentive into our income scheme so that we can preserve that because it is very important that we have an educated society, obviously. And if you put yourself, for example, in the place of a, um, a secondary student that's perhaps struggling and, and perhaps might not graduate, if that person knows that they're ultimately going to get a guaranteed income whether they finish their schooling or not, um, clearly there, there's a powerful disincentive to really buckle down and work hard and, and, and get educated. And we definitely do want people to become educated. So I think we can build some, some basic incentives into our guaranteed income scheme for education and perhaps for other things like working in the community or, or perhaps doing things that are advantageous to the, uh, to the environment as well. And finally, the, the last point that I want to make is that um, all of this is not going to unfold in, oscillate, in, in isolation. Um, obviously there are some other tremendous challenges that our society has particularly in, in areas like climate change and the environment. Um, and these things are all going to kind of unfold in parallel. You know, they're going to happen at the same time, and they're going to intertwine in ways that are ne not necessarily favorable. Um, think in terms of, of the implications of unemployment. If, if going forward there aren't going to be enough jobs and people are going to be struggling to have a sufficient income, then it becomes clear that, that it's going to be very difficult for them to focus on these other big issues like climate change, like resource depletion. Um, and so, you know, it's going to be a real problem to, to, to really move politically in terms of um, finding solutions. And uh, very often we're represented with sort of two totally different opposing viewpoints. On one hand, you have the people who believe in limits to growth and in the idea that uh, the planet is about to reach or has exceeded its carrying capacity and so forth. And on the other hand, you have the techno-optimists who believe that technology is going to solve all these problems, so we don't have to worry too much. But one of the main themes that, that I want to present and that I've been talking about today is that technology is going to create its own problems. As, as we begin to see jobs disappear and, and incomes for a great many people disappear and um, possibly even growth limited in terms of where our economy can go in the future, you know, those are all going to be real problems created just by technology. And we're going to have to have a kind of a, a cohesive view which looks at that and also looks at the, the environmental issues and climate change and so forth. And, and we really need kind of a comprehensive solution to, um, to all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this, well, kind of nightmarish. Please, um, please stay here. Stay here, Martin. I want to ask some questions. Um, thanks for this, uh, well, nightmarish prediction of the future. Um, we we're talking about the possible solutions to this problem. Um, but I missed revolution. Um, <laughs> The Luddites you were talking about, they started a revolution. One of your predecessors called Karl Marx, he said that the only way to solve this problem is, is the revolution. What do you think about that? You know, in, in general, I, I still believe in capitalism, and I believe um, kind of what Winston Churchill said about democracy, which is that you know, capitalism is awful, but it's probably better than the alternatives. Um, the main problem I have with, with socialism and with any kind of revolution that entirely gets away or, or does away with capitalism is that I, I, I do believe in the importance of incentives. It is important to give people and also investors and, and everyone else in the economy the, the proper incentives to, to go out and do things which are um, really, you know, that will benefit everyone. Um, and the problem with socialism is that you have this idea that uh, people should contribute what they're capable of 
uh, and then at the same time you should get out of the system whatever you need, and that sounds great, and I think it, it's, as a philosophy, it's, it's a good idea, but without the appropriate incentives, it's really hard to see that how that's going to happen, you know, just because of the, the, um, the psychology of people and the way people behave. But isn't your talk, uh, when I hear you, your, your talk, I think, no, capitalism is a wrong philosophy, and it worked, it, 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 it didn't work. Well, you know what, it worked, it worked for a while. Um, and it, 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 I don't, you can't argue that our, our society today is a lot more prosperous than, um, than it was in the past. I mean, if you, look, if you go back 100 years, for example, and compare the living standards then to the living standards today, there's no question that, at least in developed countries, we're dramatically better off. I, mean, I don't think anyone here would want to trade places with someone who lived 100 years ago and give up all of the modern um, conveniences that makes, make our lives better. And, and the fact is that that's really all come about because of technology. And, and, technolo and uh, capitalism has, I think, done a good job of creating the appropriate incentives to help move technology forward. We wouldn't want to get rid of the system that has, has allowed that progress. Uh, so my argument is not to destroy capitalism or get, get away or you know, replace it entirely, but rather to modify it. I believe that we are moving into a new age and we need to adapt it for that new age. It's not going to work as well anymore, but you know, I think it can be fixed. I don't think we have to completely throw it out the window. And if we were to do that, it's really not clear what else is out there as, as a solution. When you propose a basic income for everybody, that's kind of a socialistic capitalism. That, that, that's an interesting point, and, and it's, it's, um, what, it's the reaction that a lot of people have, but it, if you look at economic history, the people that uh, have proposed a basic uh, or guaranteed income were actually not socialists, they were very conservative, actually. Um, Friedrich Hayek, who wrote the, the famous book, The Road to Serfdom, was very, very strongly opposed to the whole idea of socialism, uh, supporting the basic income. So it, it's a little bit different. Uh, socialism, socialism is more really the, the collective or, or the, the government taking over the entire economy and owning all the industries and the means of production and uh, trying to plan the economy and, uh, and rather than having a market economy, we've got some, some agency or some group of people that tries to plan all of that. And uh, you know, that's been shown pretty clearly not to work. It was shown in the Soviet Union and, and, and in other communist areas. So uh, a basic income is really not a socialist idea at all. It's, it's, it's really um, a capitalist idea. And it's the idea that you give people a sufficient income so that they can then go out and participate in the market. They can spend their money. And um, as they spend their money, the market, in other words, the market pricing mechanism will very efficiently make things, you know, allocate things throughout the economy. You work in Silicon Valley, or you used to work in Silicon Valley? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. How do your colleagues or former colleagues react to your story? Um, you know, they're, they're coming around. Um, uh, Silicon Valley, there are a lot of libertarians. There, there are people that really don't want to be taxed at all, and they believe very strongly in, in the idea that everyone should have the fruits of their own labor and that you shouldn't have any kind of, um, uh, you know, you shouldn't have the government coming in and, and reallocating uh, or redistributing wealth and so forth. Uh, and, and the problem with that, of course, is, is that it's very elitist. Of course, Silicon Valley is populated with people that have edu education from MIT and from, from all these uh, elite universities and they're very technically skilled. And, they happen to be doing very well in this new economy, but they don't really see so much all the average people out there that, that you know, come to work and do routine jobs and are perhaps not doing quite so well. Uh, but I think they are coming around, and uh, I, I see more people open to this idea of, a, of perhaps a guaranteed uh, income. Uh, you're never going to get them to buy into socialism. I don't think that, you know, it's just totally uh, opposite from their thinking, but I do think that eventually they'll Especially because of the point that I make that if we don't give people an income, there aren't any consumers. Um, even if you work in, in Silicon Valley and you've got a lot of technical skills, ultimately, whatever it is you do, you've got to sell to someone. Um, you know, whatever you produce, you've got to be sold to someone. And 
if we don't have people that are able to buy uh, a new iPhone or a new Android tablet or whatever, then uh, you know, even the, even highly skilled people are, are going to find that uh, their labor doesn't have as much value. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, Martin, I was wondering about the incentives, uh, because your own example, uh, you write a book in your free time, uh, suggests that people do want to work, even though they have uh, a fixed income. That's right, and I think, I think people would. Um, you know, if we gave everybody a basic income, not necessarily an extraordinarily generous income, but a basic income so that they can survive, I think that... Uh, most people, most people are not fundamentally, overwhelmingly lazy, I don't think. Most people would want to go out and do something productive. And, uh, it, you know, it, it would really depend on the skills of that individual and what they could do. But I think a lot of people would start, for example, part-time businesses to supplement their income. Or they might, they might go out and do productive things without getting paid. I mean, you see, of course, there's a tremendous amount of... Um, uh, activity already, things like you know Wikipedia, where so many people contribute to to writing this encyclopedia, and they don't get paid for it at all. Um, and, and then there's open source software, the same type of thing, where programmers um, contribute. So yeah, there will be a lot of that going on. But one of the problems is that although we see that kind of activity already, it doesn't help us in terms of having an income. And that's one of the reasons I'm proposing to give somebody to give everyone at least a base, basic, you know, um, platform. And people think that he can continue to do other things on top of that, but uh, you know that would at least give them a, a livable platform. Yeah, um, I'm a great talk. I was wondering if you, what your take is on the political viability for these kinds of ideas, because I know. In 2012, the uh, Democratic uh, Convention, Bill Clinton gave a huge speech about uh, the economy, and he, said, he referenced, uh, he said, yeah, it's sort of, it's math. Uh, the viability for, uh, the economy basically needs minimum wage, minimum wage rate, so I think the ideas are there, but could you comment a little bit on the American system and how that might incorporate these ideas? Yeah, um, you know, in the United States, this is really kind of unthinkable at this point, I would have to say. I mean, I. I I talk about it, and I hope people will listen to it, um, but I'm certainly not optimistic about it happening in the United States. Um, one of the unfortunate things we see is that when people come under economic stress and they worry more about the future and, and their own incomes and so forth, there is a tendency for them to become more conservative. And they become very fearful, and uh, uh, sort of the poster child for that is the Tea Party in the United States, where you've got these people that I think are just terrified of the future and of the way the country is changing. And so what they do is they embrace a sort of imaginary past. past. Uh, they imagine the 1950s in the United States in a way that it probably didn't even really exist, but they would like to go back to that imaginary time. And um, so it's really hard in the US to see how, how we're gonna move in that direction. I'm hopeful that here in Europe, things might be different. Um, you know, as you know, in Switzerland, they, they've been talking about these issues. Um, another country that I think might possibly be, be you see this kind of progress would be Japan. Um, you know, Japan also has the advantage of, of having a very homogenous society. And, and the unfortunate fact is that in a country like the United States, which, very, which is very diverse, and where we have different races and so forth, it is unfortunately um, more difficult to to build strong uh, social safety net programs because you know there's a lot of a lot of problems there. Um, so I my guess is that we're going to see progress on these issues in other areas, not in the U.S. And um, perhaps we will then follow along, just as we've done on healthcare. You know, you may have heard that Obamacare is coming online with with lots of problems, but still it's a tremendous uh, accomplishment for us to to get what you all have had uh, for you know, decades. Nice final words. Thank you, Martin Forbes.